Good morning, guys. Can you hear me? Uh, yes. How are we doing? Okay. Okay, let's get started. Um, so today, let me just write down what I had in mind. Um, right, so today we're gonna look at the uh, projects. So we need to pick one, pick one uh, by uh, uh, spring break. <clears throat> And, um, and this year's on, on the syllabus, the project description. And then for the rest of the core, uh, for the rest of the lecture, we will look at um, uh, simulation. Uh, we're gonna be looking at um, a couple of different follow-up from last time. These are some loose ends uh, from last time. Uh, we're going to be looking at this uh, other way of simulating the Milstein scheme. And we're going to be looking a little bit at Brownian bridges. I don't know if you guys have seen Brownian bridges before. Um, there are some in um, the textbook. There are some here in. Uh, in the textbook that's been used for um, uh, for when I taught 485 for the undergraduates, but and for those of you that are taking uh, uh, six that are taking 622, um, inside here you'll find a chapter or a section on uh, Brownian bridges. It's down here in the bottom, 4.7. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about Brownian bridges today. Is also uh, um, running bridges. This will go. You can also find that in Shreve's in Shreve's book. Uh, then we'll do a little bit about um, like an application uh, to risk measures. And uh, I'm guessing this is how far we get. Um, if if we have more time, uh, we're gonna look at Heston's model. And this will be uh, homework for. These things here, these are um, these first two here. They will be about uh, this homework that's due. Uh, homework two that is due uh, soon. Okay, so I want to start talking a little bit about projects, uh, so you guys can make up your mind. Um, and then we'll, we'll get into the material. Are there any questions before we begin? <clears throat> okay, so let me switch over to the um, to the syllabus. All right, so you go, you can, if you haven't looked at the syllabus, you can find it over on Canvas somewhere. Um, the most important thing about the syllabus, of course, is that if you go here to the end, um, you can find a schedule. So you can see all the things that we've talked about and every week I update it. So you can see what the next lecture is about. So today, this is uh, numbers, lecture number six. And, um, and you can see, this is what we'll be talking about today. Um, there are, there are information in here about the projects, like so what um, what topics uh, I propose, and also what your um, what your um, project should uh, should contain. So there's a description here about the final project, like what you should write, um, uh, what what sections you should write, and. Um, uh, so here's a little uh, outline of like the various components. Um, 
And so the main, the, 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 the report should be 15, uh, up to 15 pages uh, long. Um, of course, excluding uh, like your code, it doesn't count. Right, so your report excluding title, abstract, table of contents, and appendices should be 15 pages long. It can be shorter, but it should not be long. Um, so what are the projects that I propose that one could do? Um, I, I taught this class here uh, maybe two years ago, and I learned there that most students, they are very interested in equity derivatives. And um, so there are most projects here about equity derivatives because last time I had only put a few on and the students, they really wanted um, to do something more about equity derivatives. So there are uh, European derivatives when you price in a model that has jumps. I put a few of those on here. Uh, there's a, uh, the first model with such of, of this type is due to Merton um, in 76. So it's been around for a while. Um, so that's one model. Uh, a small variation of it is uh, you combine, instead of doing Heston and Merton, you do Stein and Stein and Merton. These will be uh, implementations using these characteristic functions that we have also done, uh, that you will also be doing in, um, in homework number four. Um, then you can switch it over and you can look at, um, you're also going to be doing American um, uh, derivative pricing in uh, in class. That's going to be uh, that's going to be the last homework you'll be doing. But you could also do it. Uh, they will do it in a simple like Scholes setting, so constant volatility. But you could do American derivative pricing uh, with stochastic volatility models. Uh, so there's one proposal here to do American derivative pricing in Heston and American derivative pricing in Stein and Stein, just different volatility models. When we did that last year, um, these two projects here on American derivatives, they are a little bit, the more complicated. Um, the more complicated, these two projects are more complicated than, uh, than the first ones where you, do, uh, where you do these characteristic functions. The American derivative here, this, this, um, this is based on finite difference methods. Again, something that we'll talk about after spring break, um, but they're gonna be two dimensional finite uh, difference me uh, methods. And, and so that's gonna be a bit more tricky. Uh, that being said, there were really some students uh, a couple of years ago who did, who did very well on this American derivative pricing. Um, so the first four proposals, the all on equity, uh, equity derivatives, European or American in, in these um, uh, more general settings and we'll consider in class. And I, I've added some references. Uh, then I also put a project on uh, fixed income. I mean, fixed in the fixed income market is huge, right? And and some of you are, are likely going to end up at least for some part of your career to be on a, a fixed income desk. And so, one could have a project on uh, fixed income derivatives. Uh, then there are also projects on credit. Um, this is not nearly as popular as it was in the mid, uh, like in, in the early 2000s up until the financial crisis in 07, 08. Um, but if some of you wanna, uh, if some of you are interested in, um, in looking at uh, credit derivatives, um, you can see the references here exactly for around that time, just before the crisis. And um, I mean, there's, there's math in here, the jump processes in here. This is when the issuer can default and how do you take that into account? And so you can have single name and you can have basket derivatives. Um, so the buzzwords for single name is the CDS, the credit default swap. And then the uh, CDO is for multiple, uh, multiple names, the credit uh, uh, debt obligation. And then, <clears throat> Last year, last time I taught it, there was one student who wanted to do uh, his, his or her goal was to do a, a PhD. And so that student uh, wanted to do something that was more academically uh, minded. Um, so I put two projects on 
uh, on here at the end. Uh, these are projects that I'm uh, personally, my research is more aligned with uh, inside training models or asymptotic, uh, asymmetric information models. Um, and in particular, this last one here, predatory trading. Uh, these are, uh, uh, it's not like people in outside the academic world they don't care about it, but these are more, uh, they have more flavor of a, um, uh, like a, a PhD thesis, uh, at least in the beginning. So I don't know if anybody has interest in that, but that's that's like the collection of projects that I'm, I'm proposing. And I put a cab up here on four students for each. Um, I think we have six or seven students uh, currently submitting homework. So I don't think this cap here is going to be uh, be particularly relevant for uh, for this class. Are there any questions or comments about about these projects? Yeah, are there any any thoughts or do you guys just want to think about it for a little bit and then uh, we can talk about it next time so it's it's about spring break this is when you need to make up your mind and, um, and you start start looking at some of the papers that are listed in there and try to figure out what's up and down in, in this topic but you should pick something that Pick something that uh, you might be interested in, something that you might uh, want to know a bit more about, so it could be enjoyable doing it. Um, I'll say that the last time I taught the class, there were many more students. Uh, I think I had 15 students or so, 16 students that handed in sort of 16 projects in the end. And, um, and there really were a lot of great projects in the end. Um, there were only a couple of them that were not very good, but most of them were really nice. Um, so a lot of students, the, uh, they seem to like doing these projects and um, that was a passion. So, and I think there the key is to find something that, that you might wanna know a bit more about. Uh, can you get this code to work for like a two dimensional uh, setting instead of a one dimensional setting? Uh, we'll look at find a difference uh, after spring break, for example, and there uh, we'll do it in the one dimensional case in class and we'll do it in the one dimensional case in the homework. Um, but getting a two dimensional problem to work is really tricky. And, um, and then at some point when you write the code, you have to make choices and um, the choices that you make matter. Uh, like how should you deal with this corner? And it matters how you deal with the corner for what you get out in the end. And um, uh, so, so what do you do, right? There's no right or wrong answer. It's not obvious what you should do. So it's kind of important to have this, uh, be faced with such a challenge and then make a decision for whatever reason, but you have to argue for why you made the decision that you made. And um, that you have two things that could equally well be um, the right thing to do and you have to make one because you're gonna otherwise your code won't run and uh, so how do you do that uh, there'll be lots of issues like these ones coming up in the projects and you won't see them as often when you just do a homework assignment because the homework assignment has typically been made such that issues of that sort um, they won't present themselves but in these projects you will and, and this is of course because when when you're facing a more complicated problem uh, the theory typically doesn't apply as as nicely as as it does in the uh, in the more controlled uh, sterile uh, problems that you see in the homework and you see in the lectures. Are there any any questions, or should we get started on the lecture? Okay, I'll get started on the lecture. Um,
so <clears throat> we had so we have a um, so we're going to do a Monte Carlo simulation. So we have an SDE. So we have a one dimensional SDE typically. So we have like D Y T is equal to, and then there'll be some function in here of T Y T DT plus Sigma T Y T and then DBT. Right, and then there'll be some starting point. So we looked at, last time we looked at two schemes. We looked at the explicit oil. Right, so you grid out uh, Tn, Tn plus one. And typically you wanna have the distance just to be the same for all time points. So we call it Delta. Okay, so then, so then you create, you create or you grow a path by setting. So over here you have, you have the first one, right? So you set y t zero, that's going to be your initial point, y zero, and then you do it recursively. Uh, so then the next you will say y t n. You can express that in terms of the previous ones. So this will be y t n and then you use the formula up here plus and then you have mu and then here you'll choose if it's the explicit one you will choose to insert here y t n and then there'll be the time step delta and then you have your sigma and then the same thing t n y t n and then the brown in motion increment this would be um, This would be, uh, say, delta B T uh, n plus one. Like right, where, where um, is increment? This is normally distributed with mean zero. And this one here is variance and variance delta. And they are independent of each other over time. This one here. Delta B T N plus one is going to be independent of Delta B T N and so on. So that's how we create, that's how we can grow a path of this uh, SDE of here. You start out with the initial point and then you sample these Browning motion increments. That's going to give you the explicit order scheme. And it's explicit because if you tell me what the previous value is, you tell me what the previous value is, well, then you can get the next value simply by evaluating the right hand side. So that makes it explicit. So we looked at that last time. We also looked at the implicit. The implicit on the scheme. So it's again, it's a recursive structure. So recursively define, we start out the same. And now the difference is gonna be that where you're, when you compute this YTN plus one, it's also gonna be on the right-hand side. So you have that one. And then inside mu here, you'll put Tn plus one and y Tn plus one delta, and then the same as before. Right, so now this is implicit because you have an equation to solve. So this is the thing that you wanna note that the YTN appears on both sides. So here there's a YTN and here there's a YTN. So you need to solve and one thing that came up in the um, 
one thing that came up in the office hours was, uh, what about over here? So this, this should serve as a warning. Uh, don't, don't put, uh, don't use, don't use, don't ever use uh, sigma tn plus one, y tn plus one, instead of sigma tn and y tn. Maybe we should look at like, why not? Um, so if we do a little example, Um, if I looked at, uh, yeah, so if I looked at, <clears throat> so we're actually going to need, we need this later. So let's just do this example here. We need this later today. So if I look at, say, uh, XT, this is going to be round in motion squared. I get so take brown emotion and I squared. But then I can write this here as um, right. So we can find we can find the dynamics and uh, dxt uh, using using each of number. Using the sum with the function f of a being the square function. Okay, so let's do that. So let's do that. So I need I need the lemma. The lemma says that the dynamics of f of b t. This is equal to, I need the first derivative evaluated at bt, and then I'll do dbt, and then I need the second derivative, the critical variation term. This is again evaluated at bt, and then the critical variation of b. So let's plug in what it is. If I have the square function, then the first derivative is going to give me two, and then let me write it up here. So if prime of a, this is 2a. If double prime of a, this is 2. So if prime here, this is 2 bt dbt. Then I get 1 half times the double derivative, which was a 2. And then the variation of rounding motion, this is dt. So I get here that d of bt squared is equal to 2bt dbt plus dt. And then I can write it in integrated form. So I can integrate both sides from say 0 to t of dbu uh, dbu squared. So I have a square here. So on one hand, this will give me bt squared minus b0. Right, we always take the initial point of the Brownian motion to be zero. So that guy is zero. And then on the other hand, I computed the dynamics here. I can plug them in. I can plug them in and then I'll get, I'll get two bu dbu plus an integral from zero to t of du. And of course, the last part here, integrating one from zero to t, uh, this is just going to give me a t. And the first part, I can pull the two outside. Okay, so I can, I can collect all this, I'll get that bt squared will be two times an integral from zero to t of bu dbu. 
plus t. Okay. So in particular, in particular, in particular, uh, if I take the expectation of Brown emotion squared, this is a martingale. So the expectation drops out and I just get a T here. The second moment of the Brownian motion, this is just equal to T. Okay, so you've probably seen most of this uh, in an earlier class, but what I wanna use this example here for is well, on one hand, we need it later today, but on the other hand, it also can use, it can serve up here to illustrate why is it that we should always use the left endpoint up here. And so let me try to see if I can get this across. So when we're looking at, so we can approximate, so we can approximate, so we can approximate this stochastic integral here. Um, we can approximate this thing here using using uh, these Riemann sums. So suggestion one, so suggestion one is what? Suggestion one is we look at a sum uh, where we're summing over say N, uh, let me see. How we'll do it. We'll have a t here, uh, and I have a zero here. Right? So this is my t zero is equal to that, and this here is my t n, and then I'll have my time steps in between of length delta. So <clears throat> on one hand, I could take the integrand and I could put here b t n, okay, and then I have the Brownian increment. BTN plus one minus BTN, right? This is my delta BTN plus one. And so if I want that sum, I could sum here from zero up to N minus one. So that's suggestion number one. Here we're using the left endpoint. This is a left, left endpoint. And then suggestion number two would be to use the right endpoint. So we will have, so we will have um, BT n plus one here times the Brownian motion increment. So now this is the right endpoint. So that's the right end point. And um, for, uh, for Riemann integrals, for Riemann integrals, it doesn't matter. But for stochastic integrals, for Brownian motion integrals, it matters a lot. And so let's see that, right? So on one hand, we could try to approximate this integral, this uh, stochastic integral with respect to Brownian motion. On one hand, we could try to approximate it using left endpoints. And on the other hand, we could try to approximate it using right endpoints. Like for Riemann integrals, it doesn't matter. And that's what we're taking advantage of between the two schemes that it doesn't matter in the limit, I'm gonna take the limit as, uh, as the number of, of the mesh goes to zero, or the delta goes to zero, whether I use the right endpoint as here, or I use the left endpoint as here, it doesn't matter in the limit as delta goes to zero. 
Now over here, I'm claiming that it does matter, right? We should always have the left endpoint here, right? So this, from that, you sh there's probably something wrong here, right? So this is a bad idea. This thing here, this is a bad idea. This one here, this is a good idea. And um, how how does one how does one justify any of that? Well, let's try it out. Right, we know that the correct object, this stochastic integral, we know that that thing has expectation zero. So we know we know that the expectation of that stochastic integral is zero. Okay, so now let's have a so so we are <clears throat> we're trying to approximate an object, and one thing one could hope for would be that the uh, approximations would would satisfy the same properties as the one we know this is true and and we know we know that this object here is a martingale so if i looked at the conditional expectation given say fs you just get the integral from zero to s of bu dbu okay. this is true for any uh, t bigger than s So if we were to look at, if we were to look at the um, the left end approximation, so how would one go about doing that? Uh, so suggestion one, if I took one of these increments in here, and I was interested in conditioning. Right, so I'm looking at try to take an element in the sum and condition. So I do BTN times BTN plus one minus BTN. And then I condition say on FTN. What kind of properties do I have there? Well, what I want what I would do is I would I would use here that the first part I'm multiplying by is measurable. So he can jump outside. So he jumps outside. So here I'm using that BTN is FTN measurable. So he jumps outside and then I'm left with the Brownian motion increment given FTN. And then I'll use that this increment here is gonna be independent of the paths. So I'll just have that this is BTN. And then given that the independent, I'll just have the unconditional expectation. Right, so here I'm using that BTN is independent of no, BTN, the increment, BTN plus one minus BTN, that that's independent of FTN. And then, Finally, that expectation is going to be zero. We get zero times BTN. So you see the Martingale structure, right? Again, the conditional expectation of the future values, you drop out exactly as you're supposed to, right? What matters here is only what happens up to time S, everything that comes after, you can throw it away because it has conditional expectation zero. And now see how it changes. If we instead did suggestion two, this was suggestion one. If we did suggestion two, this would fail. If we did suggestion two, then we will compute the expectation. Are we interested in, in the sum where I have moved to, I have switched the left end point to the right end point. Okay, so how do we do that? Well, we we'll, Switch it over and we'll put here BTN plus one and then the Brownian motion increment. And now condition on FTN. 
But now we see it already starts breaking because I can't do this. I cannot pull out the first part. Like here, I could pull out this one before. This won't work here. So what do we do now? Well, how do we do this now? So we have BTN squared, BTN plus one squared minus that one. So, so what is this equal to? Is that equal to zero as it was before or do we actually get something positive here? Well, let's try it out. Let's see if I write if I write BTN plus one times BTN minus BTN, I could write this here. I need to use independence again. So what I'll do is I'll work on this term here. And this term here, I'll work on, I'll write this here as BTN plus one minus BTN plus BTN. Okay, so if I do that, I can factor it all out. I'll get the first part here squared. I can get this part times that one, that's the same, so I'll get a square. And then I get BTN, which is what I had before. I get this one, multiply that one, it's gonna give me the square. I'll get BTN here, and then I keep what's in the parentheses, so I get that term. So if I let now do conditional expectation, what would we end up getting? Well, the second part here from before, I know that this conditional expectation is a zero. So what I'll get here is, what I'll get here is, I can forget about this term in conditional expectation, just the first part here. This will be BTN plus one minus BTN as squared given FTN. And then I can use now that I have independence. I can use now that I have independence and this here becomes uh, just BTN plus one minus BTN squared. And we know that the Brownian motion increments the normally distributed mean variance zero, mean zero and variance delta. So this here becomes delta. So from this, we see, we see a bunch of things. We see that the, uh, so the expectation of suggested number two, that will be that, <clears throat> that will be that sum here. Um, That'll be the sum from n equals zero to n minus one of this thing. n equals zero to n minus one of bt n plus one, bt n plus one minus bt. By this expectation here, this would be uh, the sum, and then you'll have set delta. And how many deltas do I have here? I have n. This here is equal to n delta. This is exactly equal to uh, Tn. And this is no matter, no matter what, right? Tn, this was what have we picked Tn to be? We picked Tn to be T. This is equal to T, no matter what the time step is. So this thing here, it is not a martingale. It does not have the right expectation. And that's because we're using the right endpoint. So this is what I mean when I say it's a, it's a bad idea to use the right endpoint to approximate with. It is a much better idea to use the left endpoint because by doing that, you preserve the properties that the thing you're approximating has. For example, you preserve that it's a martingale you preserve that um, 
it has so because it's a martingale it has the right expectation if you switch down here it's not a martingale and as we see it it really does not have the right expectation either are there questions on this this example here This was something that came up uh, in a discussion with uh, Alice and Amy last Friday in the office hours, and um, I wanted to elaborate a little bit on it. Um, so don't walk into don't walk into this trap here. Uh, many years ago, when I was uh, I was a postdoc, I believe I we had there was a different problem, but we were we were playing uh, we were playing with some uh, we were playing with something that had this this uh, feature here uh, it had this there was a choice we had to make that's again these choices that i talked about in the beginning there was a choice we had to make and i had code written uh, and i collaborated i collaborated with uh, uh, other people and we didn't get the same numbers and it was only in uh, after a long time that i realized what i was doing wrong and the thing that I was doing wrong was I had somewhere in my code made a decision to use the right end approximation. And um, it kind of stuck with me. Like you should really just not do that. <laughs> the code, the results that you get out in the end, they are not correct. And this thing here, uh, you could call it an approximation of this thing up there, but it's really not a good approximation at all. Um, so, so this was in the beginning of my career and maybe I was a I was probably a PhD student at the time, and it kind of stuck with me that whenever you see these stochastic integrals uh, and you have to implement them on a computer, say, um, always look out for these choices that you make because um, Brownian motion has infinite first variation. It only has finite periodic variation. And um, that means that you have uh, less flexibility uh, in what you're doing. It's not like the Riemann integrals where it's irrelevant. Here it matters. And then uh, we talked a little bit about some of these projects where you would have uh, jumps in there, right? So then the round in motion increment over here would be replaced by uh, something that can jump. And um, that does not make the problem go away at all. <laughs> it's still very much there. So uh, choices like these ones, uh, they, they deem they will be there in your projects too. Okay, are, are there any, any questions on this part? If not, I wanna to turn to a Milstein scheme and then I wanna look at some code and see. Um... And see how, <clears throat> how it's not a big change that you have to make to switch it from Milstein to, um, Switch it to Milstein from um, from the explicit Euler, um, but let me just let me work out what the what the Milstein scheme is. So it's a little bit messy when we go through uh, how to how to derive the Milstein scheme, but it's the actual implementation of it. In the end, it comes out pretty clean. Uh, so let me let me try to work it out. So the Milstein scheme. So there, this is more accurately. So more accurately, uh, one of Milstein schemes. Uh, there are there are several of them, but. The one we're going to be looking at here is definitely a popular one. Um, all right, so what are we looking at? We're taking, um, we're going to consider, we're going to consider DXT, let me call it YT as before. So this was a mu. Yeah, it's not the notation I have on my notes, but let me see if I can make it work. So we have mu and then we have sigma as before. So what we do is um, assume that, assume mu and sigma yeah, smooth. <clears throat> so we can write 
Um, so we can write the dynamics of mu of yt. <clears throat> so assume that mu and sigma are smooth, so we can use Ito's lemma. So we'll use Ito's lemma here. I'll write this here as mu prime. And I'm gonna start dropping the input parameters because it's it's gonna get pretty long, right? So here I'm dropping, here I'm dropping, I should really write this here is more, this is equal to mu prime evaluated at yt, but I'm just writing mu prime plus, and then it's one half, uh, mu double prime, and then the credit gradation of y. So again, this here is really, Uh, mu double prime evaluated at y. And I can do the same thing for sigma. I can write, so I'm assuming again that <coughs> sigma has the derivative that I need. So always keep in mind when I have a D on the left-hand side, I need Ds everywhere on the right-hand side. So there's a D there, there's a D there. But D on the left-hand side, so we're gonna get sigma prime dyt plus one half, Sigma double prime, credit gradation of y. Okay, so <clears throat> how are we gonna go about correcting the, uh, the Euler scheme? Well, we'll do, <clears throat> we'll write, we'll write, uh, it's gonna be a long mess now. So we write it out here on the edge yt n plus one, I'll write this as the previous one. And then plus, <clears throat> then I'll have an integral from tn to tn plus one. Uh, and then I'll have my a, the mu, sorry, mu of yu du plus my sigma. And then probably motion. So now what I can do is <clears throat> I can do the same. I can play the same trick with the mu and the same trick with the sigma because I have their dynamics. So I can take those and plug them in uh, to what I had right here. So this becomes ytn plus, and then the first integral, tn, tn plus one. And now <clears throat> here, what do I write? I'll write uh, mu ytn, and then there'll be an integral from tn to u. And and you'll need the derivative mu prime dy. So I'm dropping writing these indices plus an integral from tn to u of one half mu double prime credit variation of y. So all that stuff. All that stuff. This is this is the first integral, so I need a du here, and then the second one. I'll do the same thing. I'll write an integral, tn to tn plus one, <clears throat> and then sigma. I'll put sigma uh, y tn, and then the two integrals coming out from uh, sigma dynamics. So I have an integral tn to u sigma prime dy plus an integral from tn to u and then one half sigma double prime per equation of y. So I know all this here looks, uh, it looks quite messy, but that was the last one. So I need a round motion increment db in here. Looks long and messy, but it's not really that bad. 
we can simplify here. We can collect bound in motion terms, and we can collect um, we can collect uh, uh, du terms. So let's try to do that. Uh, so I do that. Like I can, there are terms here I can plug in. Is dy, dy? I know what that is. This was mu dt and sigma dbt. So let me plug that in here. That term, that term here is uh, mu uh, d. So if I put an s here, then it'll be mu ds. If I put an s here, then it'll be mu ds sigma. DBS, vertical gradation of y. Well, then we need to look for Brownian motion term, and then we square here. So I'm going to get a, a sigma squared, and then vertical gradation of Brownian motion. This is the ds. So you can go in there. Likewise, down here, this is dys. Then I'll write it as mu ds, mu evaluated again at y, plus sigma evaluated at y. DBS, and if I put an S here, this term would be uh, sigma squared, vertical gradation of Brownian motion is time DS. So you can see, <clears throat> looking at what we have here, you can see there are integrals of the form DS DU. There are integrals of the form DBS DU. So we will have. So if you look at what we have up here, we have terms. We have terms of the forms. You'll have a um, DSDU. We'll have a term uh, DBS DU. And the last one we'll have will be um, something like uh, there'll be a DBS, DBU. Like these are the terms that we have. So let's try to figure out like which of these terms are important. Well, let's see how does um, how does the S the U operate when you're on a small interval. Well, this here is kind of like, um, this is of the order, like a delta squared, right? This is delta times delta. Um, how, would, uh, how would DBS DU operate? Well, how is DBS? Well, BS has, has a variance that is equal to delta. So without, without the square, what you would have is this would be like a square root of delta times du. This would be like a delta. And then the last one, well, this would be this would be like a square root of delta. This would be like a square root of delta. And this would be like a delta. So you see of all these terms, the lowest order is this guy. This is the lowest order. Right, so he's the most important one. This is the most important term. So what we're going to do is, for the Milstein scheme, you throw away everything else. And you keep just the most important term. So the Mills time scheme says you write y t n plus one as so this is this here's the Mills time scheme. <clears throat> you throw away everything else that doesn't have this uh, uh, that doesn't have this term. So all these terms here they just to get discarded. You write this as y t n. And then you look up here, you have the integral Tn, Tn plus one. Uh, so you have your mu times, uh, there was a du over there. 
So let's see, are there any terms? This is the UDS, this is thrown away. This is Y, DB, this is thrown away. So you just have a DU here. And you look over here, you have integral, TN, TN plus one, you have sigma, Y, TN. <clears throat> so what are the terms? There is a sigma squared ds dbu. So that term is just neglected. There's something in here. There's a dbs and a dbu. These are the lowest order terms. So if you forget about the mu here. You have a plus, and then there'll be the integral from tn to u. You'll have your sigma prime out there, and then there'll be the sigma, and then there'll be a dbs, and then it'll be a dbu. So this is what the Millsum scheme is about. And um, if we just work out some of the terms, right, this term here, this term here, this would be YTN mu evaluated times delta because that's the timeline. Similarly, over here, the first term, this would be sigma y tn, and then the Brownian motion increment over the time interval tn to tn plus one. What about the last one here? So we need to figure out what that is. So the last term is a little bit, <clears throat> a little bit new, and this is let's work out what that one is. So. So when I'm looking at the integral from Tn to U, and then we write it in here, sigma. So this was supposed to be evaluated at Ys. So this is sigma prime, sigma over Ys, and then you have dBs, and then you have dBu. Okay, so <clears throat> you're gonna approximate this by freezing it at the left endpoint as usual. So you get sigma, over y t n sigma prime sigma y t n and then there'll be an integral then there'll be an integral from t n to u d b s and then you need a db uh, d b u so that's also an integral out here t n t n plus one right this one here this is the uh, u variable this one here is the s variable So there'll be uh, an integral here from Tn to Tn plus one. This is the U variable, this one here, the S variable. Of course, the inner integral here, this is something we can work out. This is not complicated. This is B U minus B T N. Okay, so now we start here with it. We have to out of integral two, so we need to work out what that is. So we we need we need an integral from t n to t n plus one of the integrand. Now this is b u minus b t n d b u. Okay. So let's figure out what, what that term is. And this is why I wanted to do the exercise from before, because from before what we had was, that was why I wanted to do that calculation from, from before. Right, so we need this later today. So that time has now come. Uh, in this example, we needed that later, and this is where we need it. Uh, what was that? What was that integral that we were we were looking for? Uh, the uh, the integral is right here. Uh, instead of a zero here, I could have put an s, and that would have given me the integral from uh, s to t of that d b u d b u, which is what I need on 
on that later slide, right? So from before, we actually know what that stochastic integral here was. Right, so this, this is just a little recall from slide uh, four that the integral from say is to t of bu dbu, recall what that was equal to. This was equal to, uh, if I put a two here, I would get uh, bt uh, squared minus bs squared. Uh, and it'll be minus t minus s. So we're going to use that right up here. <clears throat> the two, I can put it to the other side. I'll get one half. And then what will I get? I'll get B T N plus one squared minus B T N squared minus a delta. That was that part. And then I have the second part here. This is minus B T N and then the running motion over the interval B T N plus one minus B T N. So let's see if we can simplify. Simplify this expression there. <clears throat> see what we get. We have this term here becomes minus bt n bt n plus one plus bt n squared. Okay. Uh, so, so I have a half of my delta. Okay, so that's minus a half of my delta. That sits out there. I got plus a half of the BTN squared. Uh, BTN plus one. What happens if I move that square outside? So I get something like this. So would that work? I got the minus a half. This is okay. I got a half out there. So what do I have here? I have minus, I have plus BTN squared. That's good. And then I have this one here it comes with also with a plus a half. And that's good because I have minus a half here and I have plus a full one here. So that works. And then I have um, two times the two times the product times a half. That's a one with a minus sign. So that's good. So all overall, that last that last expression here, we calculated it. We calculated this object up here to be um, sigma y t n sigma. There's only one prime, not two primes, sigma y t n, and then <clears throat> one half, and then the rounding motion increment, delta b t n plus one squared minus delta. And so overall, the Milstein scheme becomes a correction to the Euler. And so overall, get the Milstein scheme to be delta y t n plus one. You get the usual terms from the previous slide. That would be uh, mu y t n delta plus sigma y t n running motion increment. But then there's a new correction term. The one that we struggle to compute. Uh, 
this one here, there'll be this new term plus uh, one half sigma prime ytn sigma ytn and then that Brownian motion increment squared minus its expectation, namely delta. So this is the Milstein correction. This is the new term. And it's a higher order uh, correction term. So this was a long calculation, but in the end, what we get out is really not that bad. And um, if you look at it in some examples, maybe it will, it will help. So if you look at it in like an Ornstein Nuremberg setting, this is when mu of A would be uh, kappa theta minus A, uh, sigma of A would just be beta. Right, so there, there will be no correction because the derivative here is zero. So there will be, there will be no correction term. Because if I calculate the derivative, get zero. Uh, another example would be a geometric bounding motion. So there you have that mu of A would be uh, some constant. Uh, say alpha A, the sigma of A would be another beta A. So here there will be a correction term um, because we'll have sigma prime of A would be beta. So Euler, so if you look at the Euler scheme, Euler looks like uh, the increment is alpha y t n times a delta plus and then beta y t n times the increment of running motion. That would be the Euler scheme. And now we get the correction term. Whereas Milstein looks like um, delta y t n plus one. It's going to be the same as Euler, but there will be a new term. And so, what is the new term? <clears throat> it would be it would be uh, so one half, it would be one half sigma prime sigma, sigma prime sigma, that would be my beta squared times y t n, no square. And then we have the Brownian motion increment, delta b t n plus one squared minus delta. So this here will be the two things will the two schemes will be the same except for this correction term that means times. Let me do the one with the CIR process too. Um, the CIR process, this is where we have a mu is kappa theta minus A, sigma is that square root. So we need a derivative of sigma. This would be beta divided by two square root of A. So again, for this stuff to work, we need A to be strictly positive. Like, so just look out for that one. Like we're dividing by square root of A. So 
the CIR process. If we do the filler condition we talked about last time. So filler's condition is uh, the drift has to be strong. So what it means to be strong is that it's bigger than one half beta squared. This one ensures that yt is strictly positive. So we typically have that condition every time we work with it. But as we talked about before, it can be problematic to simulate it because you can still get uh, negative values here. Um, so that was Feller's condition. What does the Milstein correction look like? So in this case, Milstein, it'll be the Euler, delta ytn. <clears throat> read the Euler plus the correction term. The Euler would be kappa theta minus ytn delta. And then same thing for the, here you have the ytn times the Brownian motion increment. And then comes the correction term. The correction term is uh, one half sigma prime sigma. So sigma, this was beta. This was beta square root of a, square root of a will cancel out, but we have a half here. There's a two, this will be beta squared. And then you'll have the rounding motion increment squared minus its mean. So that will be the correction. Term. So when you write the code, it's, it's, not, it's not a big change you have to make. It's, um, yeah, you just have to look at the derivative of the volatility if you want to do uh, the Milstein correction. Try to pull up some code. You can look at you can look at some paths. So I pull up some code. I'll share screen. This was left over from last time, so lecture five. There was a question, so let me get to it. What is the Milstein uh, scheme correcting for? So it's, it's the order of convergence. Um, so we're not we're not going to prove the um, the order of convergence for these uh, Monte Carlo schemes. We will prove these order of convergence for the um, ODEs that are coming a bit later. Um, so the Milstein scheme it 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 picks off uh, the lower order uh, error term. Right? The uh, on one of the slides we had, we looked at this DW or DBS, DS. This is an, yeah, it's dropping, it's dropping the lowest order term. It's, it's taking that into account. You, you could have, we could have done, you could have done the same thing. We could, we could have included more terms. Um, let me just pull them up. Right. <clears throat> Up here, this is this is correct, right? There is no there's no approximation. This is an equality. Um, y tn plus one is actually equal to all these terms. Um, so we could have included more terms in the uh, in the scheme. Right? We could also have included the second lowest term. So we could have included these corrections, or we could have included these corrections. But here we included this one, just the lowest order, right? So we, we included those ones and hoping that this is gonna give us a, um, uh, a better approximation. But th that's why I'm saying there are multiple Milstein schemes. And you can see if I wanted to start including this, uh, these terms here, then where would they be, right? There'll be something, there'll be a mu here. There'll be a mu here ds and then db right so that that means that now mu is going to come into into play the same thing up here uh there's a mu prime and there's a sigma and then there's a dbs and a du term so if you wanted to include also those terms here 
then you see mu matters. You'll have to have mu's derivative and you'll have to have mu coming into the uh, correction term. So then you will get an even, uh, uh, yeah. then you do two correction terms. And then of course, if you're on the last one, you'll have to do three correction terms. So here we're just looking at the simplest case where we're just correcting for the volatility terms uh, because they have the lowest order. Okay. I'm gonna see if I can get the code to run. See if I can get the code to run. Right, so this here is my, uh, this was the, uh, the code we also looked at last time. We are simulating a square root process. Um, so we have the three schemes. We have the YE is the explicit Euler. This is the implicit Euler and M for Milstein. Uh, as we talked about last time, but let me say it again, is uh, when you write, uh, when you simulate uh, normals, you look out for the code that you're using. Does it take in standard deviation or does it take in variance? Uh, last time we looked up MATLAB takes in standard deviation. So then you have to have a square root of delta K. And then you go down, so you have the uh, explicit and the implicit, mil, uh, the explicit and implicit Euler schemes, those we looked at last time. And here we're doing a CIR process or a square root process. So <clears throat> the last part here, the last part is over here. This is the, uh, this is the correction term that one has to make if you wanna do uh, the Milstein correction. So this part here, this is, this is the new part. Uh, and so what I'm doing is I'm, I'm just plotting, I'm just plotting them uh, in the same graph. I'm using the same Brownian motions and I'm, I'm asking you guys to do the same thing in your homework so you can see these differences. Uh, you fix the path of the Brownian motion and then you grow these paths of the SDE, the Y process, um, and see how, how they look like. So let me try to run it. I can get it to work. And here we have the three paths. Uh, the, they are not, of course, the same, but if you zoom in, see if I can zoom in, you can see that there are three paths. So they're not quite the same. Uh, and so one thing that, that you can do is uh, you can take uh, the Black-Scholes formula and you can run these three schemes, growing the stock price, plugging them in, and for example, seeing um, how do they compare, right? So there's a more elaborate example in that homework that is due uh, soon. Let me, uh, let me pull it up. Homework three. This one. This is where we are. The first part is about growing uh, paths using these various methods. But at the end, I, I put in I put in a problem that's asking you to compute zero coupon bonds. Right. So we have the filler process, and there are of course many ways you can grow this filler process, as we talked about. Um, so the first part of the problem uh, does the trick that we talked about last time. So find these ODEs for A and B. B is gonna be a Riccati equation, so it's gonna have a complicated solution, but still, like it's a Riccati equation because B prime depends upon B squared. That's what makes it a Riccati equation. And then, so you have closed form expressions for the zero coupon bonds in this, in this model. Think about X as the interest rate or X being a constant plus, uh, the interest rate being a constant plus X. Uh, there are some parameters, plug them in, run them. Here I'm asking you guys to do it with the Euler scheme, but there's nothing that prevents you from doing the same thing uh, using uh, the implicit and using the explicit Euler scheme. And then what you can do is you can compare uh, how does the three schemes compare, um, how does the three schemes compare to the analytical uh, expressions that you got? Because you also have these zero coupon bonds, uh, you have them in closed form, for question number two. Right. So this will be one way for you to play with uh, the three schemes and see how, uh, I mean, does this correction term in the Milstein scheme, does it matter? If I switch over, instead of using the left endpoints here, but I solve the equation uh, when I put in XTN plus one here, would that buy me anything? 
And of course, you're going to be facing this problem that you have a square root in here. So you need to do something about it. Uh, the Euler scheme can end up being negative. And, and so sometimes you'll take a square root of a negative number here. And so you need to, you need to make a choice. What do you want to do? At the end, I'm making a suggestion. That was the one we talked about last time. Maybe you should try to do log and see how that goes. So at least this would be one way to get some sense of, does that correction term buy me anything? This here is a model for zero coupon bonds. Um, does it buy me anything to do that uh, correction term? Are there, are there any questions, uh, comments about, about what we were looking at? Okay, if that's not the case, then um, then let's move on a little bit. Uh, now we talked about the Milstein scheme. Then we spent a little bit of time talking about uh, Brownian bridges. Um, so again, this you can find um, you can find uh, more about that in, in Shreve's textbook. Um, it comes in there are there are applications of this Brownian bridge in. Um, there are many different applications of Brownian bridge uh, theory. It um, the the place where you see it is um, is over in that homework. Let me just pull it up so you, we can all look at it together. All right, so we're doing this. Uh, we're doing these paths of a bunch of different processes, and there's one here about the Brownian bridge process. This is this guy here. This is this guy here. You start the process on it at zero and then it runs and so there's a peculiar dynamic that has this um, minus y over one minus y t and so you can see what happens is that as little t gets closer to one as little t gets closer to one you're dividing by something that is very very small so you divide by something that's very very small you're going to get something that's very very big right so if say that y is negative Say that yt is negative. And, so, and you're close to one, time is close to one. So if y is negative, then minus y is positive, and you're close to one. So you're taking a positive number and dividing it by something that is very small. That means that dy is going to be humongous and it's going to be positive. Right, so if you're negative and you get closer to one, the change in y is going to be huge. That means that it's going to drive it up. Likewise, if y is positive and you're close to time one, well, then y is positive. You're divided by something very small. This is going to be humongous. You get a minus sign. This is going to be very, very negative. So the change in y is going to be very, very negative close to one if y is positive. So that's going to drive it down. So this process here is peculiar because as you get closer to time one, this process here is going to be driven to zero. And that's why it's called a bridge. It starts at zero and it ends at zero. So when you go over the paths for y, you're going to be looking at a stochastic process that starts at zero and ends at zero. But in between, it has um, it, it wiggles around. But the endpoints are tied. And that's why it's called a Brownian bridge process. So I want to talk a little bit about this because it has appeared, uh, it has appeared in many different places. Um, and if for nothing else, uh, there is, um, I've had, I've had two students come back after job interviews that have been asked about Brownian bridge processes, and it's not always covered in six, um, 
in 6.2.2 and it's not always covered in 4.85. Like I did not cover it um, uh, to any uh, serious extent in, in 4.85 in uh, last semester. So I want to spend some time talking about it here. It's a nice process to simulate. Um, so I, I want to take take like half an hour and talk about the running bridge process. How does it work uh, from a mathematical point of view? And I want to address this uh, interview question that the students have got. Uh, because there's a nice uh, there's a nice way to uh, try to get grip on it. This is not a like one of the most important processes in the world. It's not like a geometric running motion. It's not like a, a CIR process or no Salunberg process, but it is it is a process that that people know and people use. I've seen it used in simulation. Um, yeah. So let me, let me talk a little bit about the Brownian bridge process and then uh, we'll take a break. All right, so Brownian bridge. Right, so you take a Brownian motion to so BT. I want to take the bridge between zero and one, just like in the homework. So, right, so this is a Brownian motion. You're going to have your filtration I'm going to have your filtration if t. This is a sigma algebra that makes all these bs's measurable for any s between zero and t. All right. So now you do. Now you do. So if you if you were to simulate it, and we've done that, it starts out down. It starts out down here. This is my b. So in particular, if I have, um, if I'm sitting here, say at time, uh, make sure I get it right. If I'm sitting here at time uh, S, all right, and then you have time one out here, in between you have time T. So if I am, gotta have some more space here, let me move that thing. So here we're looking at, this is BS. Okay, so <clears throat> if I am to look at the conditional expectation of say BT given FS, right, then we'll use that, it's a martingale. So we'll use that this is exactly just the current value, right? So I'm trying to estimate what is the boundary motion out here at time T. Well, this would be exactly there. This would be BS, this would be this would be exactly, <clears throat> the conditional expectation would be exactly where it is. So this is E, B, T, need more space here. B, T given F, S, this is exactly B, S. So now we're going to play the Brownian bridge. We're going to, and the way that I'm going to play it is by introducing another filtration, G, T. This here is going to be BS. And here comes a new thing. This is also going to be B1. Right? So now, if I'm looking at it through uh, the filtration GT, I get to observe the first piece of the Brownian motion, and I get to observe the value that the Brownian motion has at time one. This here is B1. Okay. So what, what happens here if I look at the expectation of BT given, instead of F, I'm gonna put in G. That's the question that people have been given in these interview questions. What is that? Yes. Right, so this here is an old interview question. And so there, there's a heuristic way of doing it. So, so we're gonna do, so we have, we're gonna have two ways, two ways. 
we're going to have a, a heuristic. And then we're going to have a, a math proof. The heuristic way, how would we do that? So imagine that you have looked at this piece and you have this value here. You're being asked to guess where would the Brownian motion be here at time t. Any guesses on how you would go about doing that? Yeah, B1 minus Bs times T minus S. Uh, you're close, you're close, you're very close. You're very close, but on the picture, I think you have the right idea. What you what you could do is you take this point here and this point here, and then you put in a straight line. And then what you do is you move out here to time t, and you go up on this straight line right here. Yeah, you're very close. You also need to divide Lee, but you're you're very close. You need the right slope. You're very close. So this here, that will be your conditional expectation. This is now we're doing the heuristic part, right? We're doing the heuristic part. So this would be B, T given G, S. So let's work out what it is. Lee is very, very close. He says, you take the B, S. So you say we do B, S here. And then we need the slope. We need the slope of the straight line. So the slope is what? B1 minus B, S. And then you need to divide by one minus s. That was the only term you're missing, Lee. And then how far out do we go? Where do we go t minus s? Right, so that's the heuristic way. And uh, my understanding in these interview questions is that if you can make a picture like this one, put in a straight line, and then then the then the people I interview, they, they tend to be happy, but given that I'm a mathematician, I, um, I want more. I want a precise argument that will show me why this is true. And so that's what I'm going to give you guys now. Um, okay, so, so this was the heuristic way. So now here comes the math proof. Uh, when you do math, is um, you've got to start with, you're going to start with heuristics. Otherwise, you're not going to get very far. You need to have a conjecture on what to prove. And that's how it goes. You need to come up with a guess of what it is and then try to prove it. And if you can't prove it, typically you go back and do a correction. And that's the cycle that you're in. So a math proof would be, um, would be as follows. So the first thing is a lemma. Um, so if uh, A, B, and X, the random variables, with um, the random variables with um, uh, A, X, independent of B. Right, so have three random variables, two of them are independent of B. Then, if I am trying to estimate X, given that I can observe A and B. <clears throat> right, so B has nothing to do with A. B has nothing to do with X. Then this conditional expectation it's simply just going to be x given a. So that's the first lemma. <clears throat> so I won't prove this lemma because then we're going to spend way too much time on this. Uh, so that's if you have three random variables, uh, you condition on condition x on 
um, on A and B, and B has nothing to do with A, and B has nothing to do with X, then you can throw away B. It is not good enough here just to have uh, B independent of A. It is not good enough just to have B independent of X. You need to have B independent of both X and A. And then it works, then you can throw away B. Uh, so given that, then, <clears throat> then what? So now we're looking at the conditional expectation, trying to work out what that conditional expectation is. So we'll be, we'll be looking at an increment like BT minus BS, and then we were given G. Right, so what are we looking at? We're looking at um, E of BT minus BS given Given what? What do we have inside GS? We'll have B1 minus BS. And then you'll have uh, uh, BS minus smaller numbers, right? Because inside GS, you'll have the path of the Brownian motion from S and downwards. So this is BS minus BS1, BS2 minus BS1, and so on. Looking here at the time, so here this is time one, this is time s, and then you'll have um, uh, s one is here, s two is here, and so on. <clears throat> so the Brownian motion increment between uh, s to t is going to be independent of um, it's going to be independent of the Brownian motion increment uh, s minus S1, S2 minus S1 and so on. And the same thing here, B1 minus BS is gonna be independent. So I can throw all these away by the lemma. So this ultimately becomes BT minus BS given B1 minus BS. And this is by the lemma. You can throw all these other ones away because all these other ones are independent of this guy and independent of this guy. So then what I have is, a brown in motion increment condition on another brown in motion increment. And that's something we've probably seen before, right? So now we're gonna use, we're gonna use that BT minus BS and B1 minus BS. Let me call them something. Let me call them, let me call this one here for X and the other one for Y. We we'll call this one here for y. The use of these are jointly normal. These are jointly normal. So then we have this trick we played. Define beta. This is my coefficient. This is going to be t minus s divided by one minus s. I'll define uh, y perpendicular. I'll define y perpendicular. This is going to be uh, x minus, and then the coefficient times y. This is something that we have seen before. If I have jointly normals, I can decompose them into independent normals, and then just check that check that y is independent of y perpendicular. And this is where we use the joint normality. It's sufficient just to compute the covariance. Right, so let's look at the covariance between y and y perpendicular. So let's look at the variance. This is uh, the covariance. This is y. Y was y was this guy. This is b one minus bs covariance with this guy and then you have x x was bt minus bs maybe I should write this out as an expectation everything here has mean zero so i can write it as an expectation times that was my y, what is y perpendicular? This was my x, bt minus bs, minus beta, and then my y. 
one minus yes. Can get this to work. <clears throat> so take these two things together. This will be an expectation of uh, what would be B1, BT minus BS, BT. And then the next part. BS is independent, so the expectation is zero. So that was the first part minus, and then you have beta. And then this one here will be just the one minus S. Right. The expectation of B1 minus BS, I multiply the T inside, I get B1 BT minus BS BT. So that was this guy. These two here are independent. You have expectation zero, so I can forget about them. Here I have my beta. And then I get the second moment of B1 minus BS, that's just the length of the interval. Okay, so then what we have here is the expectation, the variance, uh, covariance of B1, BT. This is going to be T minus, minus what? The smallest one of S and T, this is S. This is going to be minus S minus B1 minus S. And then if I've done it correctly, this would be zero. T minus S over one minus S, the one minus S will cancel and I'm gonna get zero. So we've seen this, <clears throat> we've seen this in other forms before. And what it'll allow me to do is to calculate that conditional expectation, the one we have right here. So the conditional expectation of, this is my, this is my X given uh, Y. I can write that out simply by using the formula for X. This is the expectation of Y perpendicular plus beta Y given Y. And though the first part is where I'll use, I have independence. This will just become the expectation of Y perpendicular and then beta Y. because y is measurable with respect to y, beta is a constant, this one was independent. And of course the expectation of y perpendicular is zero because x has expectation zero, y has expectation zero. So the expectation of y perpendicular is zero. I'll get beta here times y. And now I can write out what beta is. Beta was t minus s divided by one minus s. And then y, y was b1 minus bs. Right, so this thing here is so the expectation of BT minus BS. BT minus BS, this is really equal to T minus S over one minus S times B1 minus BS. And then you follow up, get the formula because of course, on the left hand side, this is the same thing as the conditional expectation of BT given GS minus BS. Right? And then you move BS to the other side and you get the formula. There's still ways to go. Uh, this year just proves. So, so now we have now we have the key formula. And then the conditional expectation of Brownian motion at a later time in this filtration, we have access to the terminal value already at time zero, right? So we should note that G zero, this is the sigma algebra that B1 generates. So you know what B1 is already at time zero. <clears throat> okay. There's still, still some way to go to get the um, SDE that was on the homework. So let me do that and then take a break. So the 
Has anybody heard about uh, the result called the reverse characterization of Brownian motion? Anybody heard about that? Have you guys gotten those of you that are taking six two two? Have you gotten into the discretization of Brownian motion yet? Yeah, Lee says yes. Okay, so I know some of the undergraduates that we have here, or some of you that haven't taken 622, you might not have seen Lewis characterization of Brownian motion yet. Um, don't worry. Uh, if, if you have the book here, you will um, uh, you'll be able to, to find it uh, somewhere in here. Uh, it happens to be Steve Shreve's, right? Steve Shreve has, uh, I mean, you can only imagine how many times Steve has taught this material. Uh, Lewis characterization of Brownian motion, it's uh, Steve's uh, favorite, favorite theorem. Um, so here's where Lewis characterization is. We're just gonna need it in one dimension. So you take a, a process, M, it's gonna be adapted. Um, if it's a martingale, uh, it's continuous, zero at zero, and has quadratic variation T. Then the thing is around in motion. So if you take a stochastic process, it's a martingale, uh, quadratic variation T, and uh, starts out at zero, has continuous path, then you have around in motion. Okay, so let me write that down. Um, M T is a uh, Brownian motion, even only if it's zero at zero, MT uh, has continuous path. The correct variation of M is T uh, and it's a martingale. So we're gonna use that now <clears throat> in conjunction with the conditional expectation we just calculated. Okay, so, so if we define BT, and I'm gonna put a tilde on top of it, here's gonna be my BT, and then I'm gonna be that correction. I'm claiming here that if I do something like this, um, I wanna put a U here. Right. I'm claiming that this object here, this is a, a G. Remember what G was. This was a G T. So that was the sigma algebra generated by the Brownian motion and its terminal value. This is a G T Brownian motion. <clears throat> okay, so just make a sanity check. Up to time T, B, T, tilde has to be uh, measurable with respect to this one, and that's good because it only involves the Brownian path up to time t as well as the terminal value. So this is okay. So we need to check all these properties here. We need to check all these properties. So one uh, b tilde at zero is equal to b zero. So that's good. Uh, two. It has a continuous path. Well, it does because B has continuous paths and this here is continuous uh, because B has and an integral like this one uh, B, B and and this object here, B, T and this one we have continuous paths. Uh, the correct variation. 
well, this is a du integral. So there's no credit variation coming in here. This is just a credit variation of B, which is equal to T. So all in all, the only thing that remains is this Martingale property. To use the risk characterization, what we need here is the conditional expectation. What we need is the conditional expectation of B tilde given GS. I want to check that this is equal to a BS. That's the question. Okay, so we can put that guy inside and compute. We can compute what this here is. And that's of course where we need, that's of course where we need the, um, the conditional expectation that we had calculated uh, just before. Okay, so let's work out what this is. Uh, I have two of these. So I have B tilde T, B tilde S. I look at the difference. I'm gonna get the increment in the B Brownian motion. B T minus B S. And then it'll be minus an integral from S to T. of B1 minus BU, one minus U, DU, given GS. So what's all that stuff? Well, the first one, that was the one we just calculated. That was the first one we just calculated. This was, uh, what was it? It was, that was the one we had on the picture. That first one we had. That was this one here. The BS goes inside. I'll have B1 minus BS over 1 minus S. B1 minus BS, 1 minus S times T minus S. <clears throat> and then we'll have a minus. I'll put the conditional expectation inside. So I have an S to T. One minus u. Of course, the p one is already g measurable, so he can stay outside. Then I have minus, and then the conditional expectation of b u given g s d u. Okay, here and u is bigger than s. So. Again, we know what this one here is because we have a formula up here. I'll just use this formula. I'll use this formula here with um, T replaced by U. So you get a U here. So we get a U here. So I have B1 minus BS divided by one minus S, T minus S minus that integral. Long mess, one minus U downstairs, B1. Okay, so we're gonna get a minus sign. So it was BS, this one, another minus sign, B1 minus BS divided by one minus S. And then we had to replace T by U. So this here is U minus S, everything to U. So it looks like a mess, but it's not really that bad because we can simplify quite a bit here. Um, we can simplify quite a bit here. We, um, uh, how would we simplify? We need to put it on, we need to put this on the same. Uh, so I wanna put one minus S outside. Uh, so let me try to do that. Do a little calculation down here. Uh, I want to put one minus s outside. Uh, so if I want to put it down here, I need to multiply it back up there. Okay, so I have uh, one minus s down here times uh, one minus u that was already there. Uh, so then I need to multiply back up here with one minus s times ps minus 
Uh, minus, no, B1 minus BS. So did I change anything on the first one? That should be the same. This guy just goes downstairs. So this is B1 minus BS times U minus S. Okay, so what do we get now? We will have one minus S, one minus U. S should start canceling. Here I have a minus SB1. And here I have a plus SB1. Okay, so I'm then left with one minus U times B1 minus BS. And then they cancel. And this one cancels and this one cancels. Okay, so all in all, what do we have? This mess in here simplifies quite a bit. It just becomes the integral of B1 minus BS divided by one minus S. You see all the U's have dropped out. All the U's have dropped out. All in all, this thing here, this becomes B1 minus BS divided by one minus S. Okay, so I'm integrating this, it has nothing to do with U, so I'm just gonna get a multiplying by the length T minus S, but that's exactly the same thing as what I had here. Like the same quantity times T minus S, this is gonna become a zero. So now, um, now we can finally derive those dynamics that we were looking for. So, so in, in the FT filtration, B is a multimeter. In the um, GT filtration, B tilde T is a multimeter. So if I look at DB, if I look at DB, I can get that by, I can get that by DB tilde plus B1 minus BT divided by one minus T DT. All right, so this here is a martingale. And this year, this is drift. All right, so when, when B1 is equal to zero, we'll get that dBT is equal to dBT tilde minus BT divided by one minus T. Dt. And that's the one in the homework. You have your Brownian motion, and then you have the dB, right? This is an SCE. B is on the left hand side, B is on the right hand side. This is an SCE. We call it Y. It has the property that when the solution to this thing, if it ends up being zero, then um, if B1 is equal to zero, the solution to this equation here is going to go to zero as little t goes to capital T. Okay, are there any questions about the Brownian bridge? This is a little bit of a, it's not, it's not a tremendously important process, but I just want you guys to see it. And in the homework, you can try to simulate it. You can see it's gonna be interesting to simulate because you're gonna be dividing by something here that is very small. Um, so, so that necessarily leads to very large numbers, either positive or negative. Are there any questions? Otherwise, we're going to take a little break and get back together, say like 10.30. After the break, I only have, um, we're going to do this value at risk simulation. And um, I think then it'll be a good, good time to, to stop. So let, let's take a 
let's take a break until uh, half past the hour, and um, and then we'll do some value at risk. Uh, okay, and then switch channel to the uh, geodesic. I'll see you shortly.